it, uh, Michael will put in the chat for you a link to um, a participant guide that we've developed for our use in the session. So I'd love you to grab that now and we'll keep adding it if we get different participants in. So as you open the Google Doc, you'll be asked to make a copy of the document so that you can take some personal notes in it. So that'll be yours to take with you. And it will um, include most of the important information that we're discussing this afternoon. So take a moment to get that organized. And I'll just um, introduce myself a little more and let you know about my background. Then I'll turn it over to Michael to have him say a few words about himself. So as Chelsea said, I'm Kate England and I'm a partnership manager with Insight Education Group. And I have been with Insight about four years now and I do a variety of things, but one of the largest projects I lead is the work on equity um, nationally at this point. So it's exciting work, but as I don't have to tell you also um, can be very challenging work, particularly in this context. So I appreciate you all being here this afternoon. Prior to coming to Insight, I was in traditional education in Connecticut where I live and I've done all kinds of things. I was a teacher, I was a principal, I was a principal of a turnaround school. Um, and then most recently before I came to Insight, I was the chief academic officer in Hartford, Connecticut, which is the biggest urban district in the state. And also many people don't know this, the third poorest city per capita in the country. So I um, had an amazing team there. I oversaw uh, quite a bit for the organization by the time I left. And while I was working my entire through line, um, the whole time was to make sure that I was doing everything with a lens of equity. So really happy to be able to do this work other places in the country now and support the work where it's really greatly needed. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Michael, to have him say a few words about himself and um, and just anything else you'd like to share. Sure, thanks. Hi, Kate. Uh, thanks, everyone. My name is Michael Moody. I'm one of the founders of Insight Education Group. Um, like Kate and probably everyone else on this call, I was a classroom teacher, I was a school leader, and I was the chief academic, academic officer in Washington, D.C. for four years as well. Um, but mostly kind of engaged in this work today. And, you know, our organization got here because we we're doing this work ourselves and really kind of our team decided it was really time for us to step into the work with our partner districts as well, probably about mm, 10, 8, 10 years ago, and have been deeply engaged in ever since. So appreciate everyone's engagement. I'm going to let Kate take it over. I'll, just so everyone knows, I'll be here in the background. I'm going to monitor the chat. I'm going to try to provide some resources through the chat as well. But if questions come up, I'm going to try to feed those to Kate as well. So please feel free to either chat me directly um, or just put it in the chat and I'll try to monitor that as we, we engage. Thanks for being here. Awesome. Th thanks, Michael. So I just want to um, uh, highlight a couple of our session norms. They're pretty much about you to make sure you're maximizing your experience. So if you would um, please just do what you need to do, right? If you have to step away for a moment, um, please feel free to do that. I want to lift up a couple of things, particularly though, this conversation needs to be a conversation. I'm happy to talk all day, but it's really important that you all participate as actively as possible. We love that. It helps make the conversation a lot more robust. And it also helps us really understand where you're coming from in your unique context. So please take advantage of that. Um, because we're a decent sized group today, um, please feel free to use the chat to put comments in there and questions. As Michael said, he'll be monitoring that for us um, and making sure that we get everybody's comments uh, acknowledged. Um, and then finally, if possible, I know we're all busy, we're, we all have big roles, but if you could close other tabs and anything else you have working so that you can devote your entire attention um, to the conversation at hand this afternoon, that would be really great. And I don't want to belabor tech etiquette. We've been living in the COVID world for a long time now, um, but just a couple of things I want to mention in particular, if you would please leave your video on as much as possible. This is really important work um, to be able to see each other as we're having conversations. So if you're comfortable with that and you're able to, um, it would be really critical for us and, and we'd love that. Please mute unless you're speaking uh, to avoid any background noise. We all know what that sounds like, both, both in our personal settings and from others. So if you could just keep those microphones off. And as I said, we do love participation. So please feel free to use the chat or unmute yourself to be able to participate in the conversation. So we have some basic objectives for this afternoon. Um, one, just to really review some important tools that we use in the work. We work a lot with Gwen Singleton's Courageous Conversation Tools and having conversations about race and equity. And then we'll be talking a little bit about our equity framework that we created at Insight Ed. And Michael's going to share that in the chat as well. We feel like it's a really solid tool for helping districts understand both where they are currently in their journey on equity and then identify some next steps. So we'll dig into that a little bit. We thought it would be really important too to lift up some of the things that we've learned both in our own travels and our personal work on equity, but particularly recently in the work of our partner districts across the country. So we'll spend some time talking about those key lessons. 
And then we'll really dig in and have a more interactive portion of the afternoon on understanding some common detours in the equity work. So things that, and you probably have some ideas about this already, obviously, if you're deep in the work, like most of you are, but what are some things that really get in your way as you're trying to do the important work? So we'll do some interactive work around that. And then finally, we'll be asking you to really think about your unique context and understand and identify something in your setting that you might be able to tackle in terms of the equity work. And we'll provide a template for that and we'll get a little bit more into that later. So that's the, um, that's the arc of what we're trying to accomplish this afternoon. And I'm extremely mindful of time. So I will keep checking my, my uh, clock as we go along to make sure I'm keeping us on track. So I would ask you to get out your participant guide. In there, we do have um, the four agreements that I'm going to talk about in a moment, as well as the Courageous Conversations Compass, and also um, some information about our equity framework. So we'll begin um, talking about those tools in a moment, but just so you know, the important thing about uh, Glenn Singleton's Courageous Com Conversations tools is that they really help us keep the conversations about race and equity on track. As we know, the conversations can be really difficult at times, so they provide the guardrails for us to be able to understand where we're each coming from and to be able to have conversations that are more effective in the face of those difficulties. And second of all, as I, as I excuse me, alluded to a moment ago, our equity framework is a great place for you to be able to understand the aspects of equity that are important, as well as to assess an entry point for you for continued work. So looking forward to really digging into those for a few minutes with you. So in the work on race and equity, as we operated inside education group, and as Michael and I each did in our separate settings before this, we always take a moment to ground ourselves in the courageous conversation tools as we do this work. They ensure that our conversations, first of all, and importantly, will engage those who won't talk. Many times we're not sure of what to say. Um, we're uncomfortable in these conversations. And those are all completely normal feelings. But the reason we use these tools is to encourage more people to be able to have these conversations effectively. Second of all, the tools that we use really help us sustain the conversation when it gets uncomfortable or diverted. The inclination many times is just to stop talking, right? Or to talk about something else. But we know that um, with safe facilitation and with um, specific tools that help us, we're able to keep those conversations moving to a point where they can get deep enough where we have a more authentic understanding and we're able to get to a place of more meaningful action. So I'm going to ask you just to review the four agreements on the screen as I'm walking you through them. And we think about staying engaged a lot, right? As you know, paying attention or not being on other devices or any other distractions. And that's true too. But when we talk about staying engaged, we're talking about really remaining uh, intellectually, morally, and emotionally in the conversation at hand. And that we're really able to involve ourselves in the dialogue more specifically. And I think a really key piece that you're seeing up on the screen is that we're listening for our partners or our colleagues' benefits and not just for our own benefit. And I will just share, I'm always candid about my own, uh, who I am. And this was a really big growth area for me when I started doing this work a long time ago because I find myself many times as I think many of us do, when I'm listening to somebody working so hard to formulate what my response is going to be or how I'm going to join the person that I'm actually not listening as carefully as I need to be to what my colleague or my friend is actually saying. So I think it's really important that we stay as much as possible in the moment of engagement around what other people are saying, particularly in conversations around race and equity. Speaking our truth just means really being open about our thoughts and feelings and trying to discipline ourselves to not just say what we think other people wanna hear. And that is very, very important in the work on race. Today, we happen to be a majority white group, but in working also in majority white groups, but particularly in places where um, there are many people of color and, and, and people of other differences, we have to um, be able to share our own perspectives in order to help other people share theirs. And also for us all to have a more deep understanding of who we are and both our differences, but also where our commonalities are as well. The third agreement is, and this is an obvious one, I think, but understanding that there will be discomfort in these conversations. I, Michael and I joke about this a lot in the work is that I love the work of equity. And you know, as I've said, I've been doing it for a long time, but when I am working with, with partners and other spaces, I don't 
generally jump out of bed and say, I can't wait to go do this work now. There's a level of discomfort. There's a level of um, just the unknowing. And that's inevitable in these conversations. But that we really try to make a commitment to bring issues out into the open. Um, because it's not talking about the issues that are it's creating the divisiveness. The divisiveness already exists in our society and in our schools. So it's through dialogues like this that even when they're uncomfortable, we're able to begin healing and begin some change that we need to see as we're trying to do the right thing for our students. And then finally, on everybody's, I think, absolute non-favorite, expecting and accepting non-closure. So certainly in a 90 minute session, we won't be able to solve and answer all the questions and the struggles that we're facing, um, but also disciplining ourselves not to look for quick solutions and answers but to really um, understand that this takes time and requires ongoing dialogue amongst all of us to really be able to get to a place that we wanna be. So I'm going to pause there and I'm going to ask you, um, first of all, to think about the agreements, take a look at them up on the screen. And in the chat, if you could just put a number between one and four to represent each of the agreements. So pick one that you think you'll need to be more intentional about upholding today in our ongoing conversation. So will you have trouble staying engaged? Are you not comfortable with discomfort? Whatever that um, agreement is that you think you'll have trouble with, please put that in chat now. And then second of all, in your participant guide, you will see a space, I believe it's on the second page, for you to set an intention for your work today to make a personal commitment to maximize your learning. So for example, it could be something as uh, simple as closing your additional windows on your screen to be able to really stay engaged. Maybe it's asking hard questions, um, sharing some vulnerability. So I won't ask you to share those, but um, just taking a, a moment to write your personal commitment for the work. And I will take a look and see what we're up to in chat in terms of what people are um, making a commitment to do here. So we're, we have a lot of people in the working with knowing they're going to not have any closure. I appreciate that very much. Um, we have a pretty even spread here, which I don't see typically. So that's great. We have people who are really working on several of the agreements is what I'm taking away from this. A healthy dose of number one, really trying to stay engaged. Um, and then a sprinkling of ones, twos, and threes. So, and then now would be a great time too to see if you have any questions about the agreements or anything I've shared so far. And of course, feel free also to um, unmute yourself and ask a question that you may have about the agreements or anything that I've said so far. All right, hearing none, I will move on and I will get into our second really important tool. And this is the Courageous Conversations Compass. And you can see there are four quadrants up on the compass. And the purpose of the use of the compass is to really have us have a way um, to understand where we are personally in this work and in general, honestly, many times our compass point is sort of our default way of doing things. But importantly, as we work as a team, and if you have opportunities to work with your staff on this or your colleagues, it's, as you do the work, it's really important to understand other people's perspectives in terms of where they see themselves on the quadrant and where they enter in. Because I, in the ideal world, um, you know, we have a, uh, an equal number of people who are placed across the quadrants, but we also know that's not generally how it happens. Um, so I'll just quickly go through each of the quadrants and what that means. And we won't use this a lot today, but I think it's really helpful context as you even consider the work that you're doing in your district or in your setting, and you think about how you're responding to some of the um, challenges that you're facing where you're entering this compass. So first of all, if you look at the uh, left-hand corner of the compass, that's the emotional quadrant. And it's really, um, for those of us who uh, have an episode or an issue around race that we're responding to or thinking about, and that issue really strikes us at a very emotional level. So it hits us in the heart and it may even cause some physical um, sensations such as anger, uh, sadness, joy, or embarrassment. So it's really you can't really think beyond that when you're at the emotional level. It's just really connecting with um, something that you're encountering through that really visceral sense of emotion. So uh, I, almost diametrically opposite to that quadrant is the intellectual uh, quadrant. And I am the person who's solidly grounded in that. Although as I do this work more and more, I find myself 
gravitating, gravitating rather among the different quadrants. But this is a person um, such as myself who takes really steps back from uh, the issue and takes a more um, information seeking approach. So, you know, you may feel yourself kind of disconnecting with the subject or not feeling that emotional about it in order to search for more intellect in information or data. And our intellectual response is very much verbal or based in our thinking as opposed to our responding or acting. So some subtle um, differences there. So then um, right on the left hand side across from the intellectual quadrant is the moral quadrant, which is relating to the soul. So it's responding from a deep seated belief that relates to the racial information or event. And justifications of our moral views may be seated. We might sometimes say we just have a gut feeling about this being right or wrong. We may not be able to articulate how we're feeling, but we know that something is not quite right when we're faced with some of the issues that we're facing around race and equity. And then finally, um, the last quadrant is relational or called social sometimes, but the key word here is really doing. And that's for those of us who feel the need to actually respond in a way that there's action. So we're, we immediately think about not only how can I solve this problem, but how am I going to organize myself to do something about it? So you can think about what I just shared and you can imagine how if we work in an organization, if you have everybody who's just kind of stuck up in their head and thinking about, you know, how am I going to read more about this? How am I going to understand this better? We're lacking people who have an ability to perhaps do something about the issue that we're facing. Um, and we also need people who feel very emotionally about the issues to, to light some fire under us to get going on some of the things that we're doing. So um, I think it's really important if you choose to use this tool that you think about your group that you're working with and how you might um, need to help everybody understand how to balance out a little bit. The ideal moment obviously is when we ourselves can bring ourselves into the center of the compass so that when we're having these conversations, we recognize what our default quadrant is but we're also able to think about how we might act from different perspectives in order to affect the, more, the work most impactfully. So this is a really detailed um, tool to use and it, I only have a short amount of time to explain it to you, but I wonder if there are any questions or anything that I can clarify for you about what I've said. Let's see, we do have something up in chat. It might be Michael putting something in there. All right, so I will go ahead and move on. So let's just take a moment to um, read the quote individually that's up on the screen right now. And as you're doing that, there's a space in your participant guide to note what resonates with you about this quote. So just take a moment to reflect on what you've read and jot down a couple of phrases or keywords that really resonate with you. And then also if you would pop those in chat so people have an opportunity to um, get into your thinking a little bit about what you think is really important about that quote. while we're waiting for people to reflect on this, Michael's just put some information, including a video from Glenn Singleton about using the compass in chat. So you might wanna look at that at a different point. And also for people who are just joining, we have put the participant guide for today's se session rather back in the chat for you to open up and be able to use. So we also have some folks chiming in in the chat about things that are resonating with them. Uh, Mark, would you mind unmuting and just saying a couple of words about what you put in there, which is self-examination. Sorry, having a hard time finding the unmute button. Um, no problem. Being open um, and, and willing to um, look inside um, our own beliefs um, and challenge them. Yeah, I love that. That's so powerful. It's, it's a, that's what this work is all about, right? We all have our biases. Biases are a part of who we are. We all have our beliefs. We have our experiences. But um, having the strength and the courage to really examine those and to also understand how powerful that can be for the students and families that we have in front of us um, is, is really, really critical. So thanks so much for, for sharing with us. Um, a lot of people are putting in their 
corresponding perspectives and experience of the racial other. Um, so Davis McGraw, could I have you unmute and unmute rather and just say a couple of words about that? Yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. I mean, I think that that's important because it uh, it really it breaks out um, just the idea that every individual in these conversations is coming from a perspective and is coming from a set of experiences. And it sort of breaks down that idea that, you know, essentializes, right? Like we're all the same or like we're all colorblind or something. It's, re it's recognizing that, you know, there's a multiplicity of different perspectives based on our experience. Yes, that's, that's, so, that's, that's so powerful too. And I think the flip side of that is that when we think that ours is the only perspective, that's when we run into trouble. And, and we do only have our set of experiences. It's very similar to um, thinking about how to better empathize, right? It's like, this is what we have, but we have to be willing to go beyond that and to understand people who have not had, had those experiences, who do not look like us, who may not speak the same language, who may be experiencing questions about their gender, et cetera. So um, just really being as open-minded as possible and having these conversations really goes a long way. So thank you so much to those of you who chimed in in the chat and also um, to our friends who are willing to come off mute and, and share their perspectives with us. So we'll get, go ahead and move on to another tool um, that we use all the time at Insight Education Group and it's our equity framework. And this is, this is another tool that takes quite a bit to get into, but I wanna just lift up a couple of things and I'll invite Michael too, if you have anything to add as I'm going through the framework, um, to please feel free to, to chime in. But what I find really compelling about this framework is that it addresses a lot of aspects in organizations that we don't typically think about when we're considering equity. And you know, many times we think about um, things like our curriculum and how we're having our students learn, or we think about how are we going to train the people that we're working with in our professional learning sectors to make sure that everybody's growing as much as possible. And those are really important domains as well. But there are so many things that go into thinking about equity in organizations in general, but particularly in educational organizations that need examination as well. So we feel like our framework is really well balanced. If you take a look at the left-hand side of the quadrant of the um, framework, rather, it gets into the system structures and resources in the district. So things like how are we um, budgeting for equity? What, what kind of financial resources are we spending to make sure that we're providing students with equitable experiences? How are, how's our district organized to do the work of equity? Do we have an equity statement? Are we, is equity a through line in our strategic plan, for example? So we do equity audits nationally and we dig into each of the, these aspects in the domain to really help organizations understand where they are doing really well in terms of equity and where they have some growth areas. Um, second of all, we talk about culture and community. How are we organized to take an anti-racist stance in our schools and our districts? Do we have comprehensive SEL programming? Um, do we have um, ways that we're supporting students that are different than our staff perhaps? And, and how are we supporting our students and families in their journey? Um, and then this is a, a really huge topic right now nationally, obviously, how are we staffing um, to represent the students that we have in front of us? So our, I, we feel like our framework is really comprehensive. And um, as I indicated, we're going to share the resource with you in chat so that you have a chance to look through it. And we really encourage you to dig into it and feel free to reach out to either one of us if you have any questions about the tool. And I just wanna show you one more way to think about um, our framework. And I, this is really critical when we think about the work in districts. And you'll notice on the outside, this is really the frame of how we think about the work. So most importantly, on the right-hand side of this frame is what are the outcomes that we have for our students? How are we making sure that all of our students have equitable outcomes to the very important things that we want them to have, whether it's instruction, whether it's extracurricular activities, whether it's enrichment, whatever it is. So what we hear a lot in districts is, for example, well, all of our students have opportunities to take AP classes, or all of our students have opportunities to um, participate in band or orchestra. So that may be true. You may have opportunities in your districts for um, students to take AP or there may be um, enrichment violin or whatever the case may be. But when you take a, digger, a deeper dive into the data, we many times see that access for a lot of students is missing. 
So I can take an example from my own experience um, as a K-12 language arts supervisor in a district that I worked in in Connecticut. And when I first started working there, I could walk into our high school and I could predict by walking um, you know, through the classrooms or even outside the classrooms and looking in the doors in a relatively diverse district, who was sitting in the seats in the AP and honors classes and who was sitting in the seats in the general studies classes. And primarily looking through the door, I would see our students of colors, of color rather in the lower track classes and our, our white students in the classes that were for AP and honors. So it turns into that, um, that exercise of really being critical and looking at our practices and understanding what we're doing as a district in order to ensure that our students all have the most equitable outcomes possible. Because we know if our students don't have access to some of the things that we're talking about, it really impacts their trajectory at being able to advance um, their courses in high school and college and, and for their outcomes in terms of, of life. So um, just to fast track that explanation, we really feel like um, looking at those opportunities and people's access to them is critical. So I'll pause there for a moment to see if anybody has any comments or questions or Michael, if you wanna add anything to what I've just said. The only thing I would add just real quickly is, you know, part of the challenge of this work and something that we've seen so frequent is there's so much time and attention being paid to the professional learning aspect of it that oftentimes it's in the, it's at the expense of those other domains. And so I think it's important to make sure kind of as we're doing this work, we're considering all the work relative to a school district, not just the professional learning piece, because that only gets us so far. I would say you can't train yourself into equity necessarily. It's going to take some more deep, deep work and kind of some work to look at systems and structures and things like, uh, you know, policies and data. So this hopefully provides with some context around kind of it being more grounded in the work of a school district. Um, the other thing we see often too is equity often sits up on the side. So we all do our work and then there's this equity strategy that's kind of living in the district, but it's generally held by an equity, you know, an equity lead. And they oftentimes report up to someone, but they don't have a team and that kind of stuff. So it doesn't find its way into the work, everyday work of the district. And so the hope is that by examining equity relative to all aspects of the district, you start to get deep into the work, but also you start to see real change pretty quickly. Thank you. All right, so we will go ahead and move on. And I did wanna share some lessons that we've learned in the equity work. Um, having been doing, having done the work rather in the equity space for a long time, we see a lot of themes. Um, and, I, and I know this from my personal work and my work before I um, came to Inside Education Group. And they're, I think they're really critical to lift up here. And you may be see, seeing some of these in your own organization as well. So first of all, I can't stress enough the importance of doing the work personally as well as organizationally. And by personal, I mean, it's just critically important to understand ourselves, even some of the quick conversations we've had today and, and recognizing that we all have biases, we all have our experiences and that we really need to understand how those inform what we bring to each situation regarding equity. So in my opinion and in my work, I, I don't believe that you can get as far with the organizational work, which means really looking at the systems around us and being willing and able to examine the inequities that exist in our organizations in order to mitigate those. So if you don't take the time to do the personal work, the risk that you run in trying to just move to the technical work in the organization is that it won't be as deep and it won't be as sustainable because enough people won't understand um, what their personal experiences, biases and backgrounds are bringing that may impede the work. So it's just critical to spend that time. And, you know, I understand the urgency. We're gonna to get to that in a moment. Like we're so chomping at the bit in our district and our organizations to dig into this because we see that students every day are um, being impacted by our lack of equitable practices in some cases. So we have that urgency and that's amazing, but we have to also temper it with knowing that this work takes a while and we have to really take the time to get into it deeply personally as well as organizationally. Second of all, it's just really critical to understand where your district is in the, in the equity journey or your organization. Um, and as we've talked about a little bit this afternoon, the equity framework can really help with that and help you figure out where you are uh, as an equity audit can. But once you've personally assessed your, um, your district's place, it's critical that you set a vision and that you plan to actualize the work. So one thing that we see many times when we're working in districts after we've concluded an equity audit and we've made our recommendations, is that um, people just don't know where to start and they, they feel like they need to do everything that we're recommending in six months or a year and nothing could be further from the truth. It's so important to stage the work 
and it's really related to what I said in terms of the work being personal and organizational, the more organized we can be around the work and the more planful we can be, even if it takes a minute longer, the more likely we are to have the work persist in our organizations. So that's another really important lesson that we've learned. We've seen the non-example of that where there is no organized approach and therefore there is no work that's sustainable or sometimes even no work happening. So we really wanna support all of our colleagues in the field with avoiding that, that issue. And as I just said a few moments ago, we all feel the urgency, right? We're working in a lot of districts right now in this space and districts are feeling the urgency, we're feeling the urgency. It's just a, it's a really critical time to be helping our students. Um, but it's just important for us to keep that urgency, to fuel our fire, obviously, but to temper that with a little bit of persistence so that we have the endurance to keep going when the work continues to get hard as it is right now. Um, and our planning can really help us with that persistence. And then I don't think I need to say this to anybody on this call. I've worked with you all, uh, some of you rather, uh, in the past few months that you know our national and local contexts context are changing every single day, every single minute in some cases. And um, the work is getting really uh, challenging right now. So we have to continue to be as nimble as possible um, in order to do the work. And, you know, as Chelsea mentioned earlier in the call, we have been supporting a lot of, of you, uh, some of you on the call right now and some other districts in Vermont as this work has been challenging recently. And we do all kinds of things to help out. We've helped districts think through how to um, create a, um, a job description for a DEI leader. We've problem solved some um, issues of um, overt racism in districts and some challenges that have occurred um, in the community as a result of that. Um, we've had helped some superintendents think through how to start an equity audit or how to discuss that with, um, with their community. So we've done a bunch of things. Michael, you may have some other things too to bring up. Those are the three that come to my mind, but I, I don't know if you can think of some other things that we've helped with um, since we started working with the consultancy here. Yeah, I think I think you hit on the kind of main ones. It's, it's been a lot around communications and even things like board management and kind of how do you kind of manage the stakeholders in both providing the feedback. You want to get the stakeholder feedback, but also you know the challenges related, especially right now with school board meetings stuff. So even kind of some of the tactical pieces around how to engage could be helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we'd also like to hear from you. I mean, these are our sort of things that we've lifted up, and we have somebody raising a hand. I see Angela. Did you want to say something? Well, I can wait too. I was just going to, it was a question based on um, one of these points and, and, and what Michael just said, but if you want to finish your thought, go right ahead. Oh no, please go ahead. Okay. My thoughts will um, always be there. <laughs> well, I really appreciate, um, you know, the point that the work must be personal and organizational. Um, and my, one of my challenges as uh, a board member for the last three years and, and as a board chair for the last year has been um, trying to figure out how to make the work organizational when the personal work is being done at, at varying levels and, and, and timelines and, you know, just even something as seemingly simple as a common read, um, you know, we have an equity literacy uh, piece uh, item on every agenda and some, we for the, for the first year, it was a, a group of board members sharing things for the whole board to read. And now it's been our superintendent acting as interim director of DEI, offering up a reading. And it's been two years now and the uh, conversations fall flat and it's like two people will speak up, you know? And, I, and it's a re, we're in this weird position as a board where many people don't wanna do the personal work in a public meeting. And so I'm just not, I'm struggling with that as a, as a board member to try to figure out how to, when our individual understanding as board members, our individual understanding of educational equity is so important as we formulate policies and the buy-in from each of the 12 board members is so important as we try to advance equity in our district. And I'm not sure how to get, and we don't have a lot of opportunities to get everyone together and, and talking about this stuff. So I feel it's a great challenge for us as a board. Yeah, no, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And that is, as I was listening to you, I was, it's just a challenging, challenging time. I will say that, but I think, you know, we have to be flexible in the work, right? I have to like, look at my own phrase on the bottom there that we have to be nimble. And 
I've grown a lot in the past six months in doing this work, just to be candid. And, and you know, I can be a little bit, um, I was going to say pig headed, which is also true, but a little bit opinionated about how to do the work. But I think what this time has taught me is that we do have to be flexible. So I think as much as possible, trying to offer people the space to do their personal development, but sort of what I'm hearing is it's not um, really pushing the agenda further as you'd like to see it being pushed further. So sometimes we have to back off on that work or find alternate ways to get it to happen in order to be able to get some of the structural work done. Because if we if we um, halt the structural work, that's not going to help either. So I think, um, you know, still treading lightly perhaps and being able to um, help people understand the importance of the personal work and the importance of having resources and taking advantage of them, but then finding some ways to be strategic in your work with your board as well and with a larger community around the things that you know will make a difference for students, um, like putting a policy in place or changing some structures in the district, et cetera, because that would be something that's a step in the right direction, even if you can't get everybody else up to critical mass. Um, I don't know if other folks have thoughts about that. I saw somebody else, I think Alex maybe was raising a hand and I wasn't sure if it was in response to this question or if you had something different. So I'll just pause to see if anybody else has any thoughts on this, maybe through their own experience. Hi, Kathleen. I, I, I raised my hand. It's Amy Rex. Can folks hear me? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it, it, I was um, thinking about Angela's comment and um, two, two sort of thoughts that I had. One is, you know, the personal work is so incredibly personal, right? And you need to be in a safe space to do that. And public isn't always a safe space. And, yeah. and so how do you create opportunities where you're able to simultaneously do the personal work that can inform the public work? And um, for myself personally, I created a, a personal race journey group. Um, and I had some colleagues, I put out sort of a, you know, this is what I'm working on and does anybody want to join me? And, and so it was a, a group of five of us and collectively we met privately and we chose readings and we pushed each other's thinkings and we just did different things and it was really fabulous and um, in the meantime with my board and I'm a superintendent um, I I did a sort of a retreat so it was it was private enough and it was well facilitated I, I you know we had a, a consultant come in but we used scenarios that we had experienced um, as a board. And she was able, the consultant was able to use those to frame them in the equity learning that they needed to do. And, and so again, it felt really relevant to them and it felt a little bit safer, although they were definitely getting pushed a little bit more. And um, so I think there are some kind of creative ways. It, it, you know, I, I think like Kathleen, it, it takes time. Right? Like this is really, you got to just kind of continue to balance that persistence with, with the urgency. Thanks for sharing. No, I think those are, those are, oh, sorry. No, it's just me, Kate. I was just going to kind of uh, piggyback on that. Amy, thanks for sharing that. I think that was really helpful. Like Angela, the other thing I would say too is, you know, we've learned to really start to embed the personal work into the organizational work. So it feels as if it's one and the same, but you can kind of use the structures to leverage that a little bit differently. So, you know, one way to do it is, you know, I think per Amy's comment too, we build what we call equity triads, um, where you find someone affinity grouping is similar to you find one or two members of your organization you want to kind of explore things deeper with. We usually host what we call an equity choice board. It's a Google Doc. It's about 15 different activities. And we let people pick which activities they want to engage in. But the key question always brings them back to the organizational work. And so, you know, we, we like to encourage individuals and small groups to do some of the work between the times we're going to meet more formally as an organization to engage in the work. And the work can have that through line. So those, those individual efforts that on the choice board or the kind of triad activities, they lend themselves to the conversation that will be had relative to the organization, but it helps you kind of put the pieces together. It's almost impossible to make this organizational and personal kind of in two separate buckets. Even if you're Focus organizationally, the personal stuff creeps in right away. I mean, we're talking about people's identities and kind of you carry your identity with you no matter what hat you're wearing in an, in an organization. So thinking about ways to offer up, you know, not just book studies, but kind of different types of resources, articles, activities, 
ways that they can engage on their own time. We structure that through you know, choice boards and stuff that we can, you know, I'm happy to help you do that too. I've, I'll keep chatting my email so you have it, but feel free to email me and I can give you some examples as well. And I see another hand too with Rebecca. Hi. Okay, before we go on, Rebecca, sorry, I just want, oh, sorry, Rebecca, I hate to interrupt you guys. Chelsea put in the chat, which I just wanted to remind people of, is that since our call is being recorded, if you would like to ask a question or a comment, but don't want to be recorded, please just um, send Chelsea a private message with your question or comment, and she'll be happy to read it anonymously. So if there's anybody who wants to ask a question but doesn't want to be um, disclosed, then we can handle it that way as well. Sorry to interrupt you. Go ahead. Um, so I just want to respond to uh, the piece on the personal work and the organizational work. And um, I'm, I'm in the um, I'm a board member on the Mount Scutney School District, and we uh, a group of us had come together um, to work on an anti-racism policy. And it was facilitated by um, Dr. Melissa Crum. And, and there were some really powerful um, experiences that many of us had in that environment. And um, the early, I think it was Angela or Amy um, comment made that uh, that that work is, is, is very personal and may not feel very comfortable in a public um, arena. Um, and so one of the things that um, hopefully we were, we wanted to do was to continue, although our policy has been written, but we wanted to continue to meet because we all felt that that space was a valuable space for us to um, personally engage in some of our own experiences and, um, and just check in with others. Um, so um, we haven't returned to that yet, which I hope we do. But I, I do think that the personal work um, really um, sort of informs us in some degree of on the organizational and, and is very valuable to, to continue and to be ongoing. Thank you. No, thank you so much for that, Rebecca. I, I, we completely agree. Um, definitely, it's sort of the hallmark of what we believe as well. So thanks for sharing that. All right. Anybody else before we move on? Great conversation. All right. So we're going to move into talking about some pitfalls, although we've kind of raised some of them, which has been great. Um, so in your participant guide, we've provided links to two of um, Paul Gorski, whose work we're going to dig into now for a little bit, his pieces, one, the equity literacy abilities and the equity detours. I'm not suggesting you open those up right now, you won't need them at all, but I wanted you to have the references for later in case you have not read his work and you're interested in just getting a high level overview um, of, of what he does. Um, I think it's a really helpful context for understanding the work that we're trying to do and, and having a research-based way of approaching it. So really quickly, you could do a whole session on either equity literacy abilities or equity detours, but we only have a little bit of time this afternoon. So. Uh, in order to understand or discuss the equity detours, we have to really understand the equity literacy abilities first. So if you take a look up at, at the screen, you'll see what Gorski calls these abilities. So they're really the foundations of equity literacy and they're a commitment to deepening our individual and institutional understandings of how equity and inequities operate in organizations and societies and how we actually play a part in those and the stages that we're in. So if you take a look you'll see that they really are organized hierarchically. Um, in order for us to be able to do anything in our organizations or personally, we have to be able to recognize an inequity. And we can't get any further on the hierarchy until we do that. So we have to actually be able to know that something is that we're seeing is not equitable. And then the second stage obviously is to be able to respond to that inequity. And you move on through the hierarchy until you get to the top two steps, which are being organizations or being able to individually actively cultivate equity or sustain equity. And the detours are the things that we do to create optics of equity progress, but they also are the things in organizations that prevent us from being able to reach those higher two steps of actualizing equity and then sustaining anti-racism. So sometimes they're the ways that we avoid the hard work of equity because we might focus on things that are a little more manageable um, so that's sort of the conversation on structures, although not entirely, um, that, but that is more manageable than, manageable than doing the personal work. Um, but it's just really important to understand that these equities are detours, excuse me, equity detours are fairly predictable. 
um, and that they do show up in a lot of the work that we do. So I'm going to briefly context the six detours that Gorski talks about, and then you're going to have some time to work in small groups to more deeply dig into them and figure out a couple of ways they show up in your organization. So we'll get into some small group work in a couple of moments. So Gorski talks about several equity detours and what we're doing this afternoon is adapted from some of his work, but the basic equity detours are the ones that you can see up on the screen, pacing for, for privilege, deficit ideology, celebrating diversity, colorblindness, shiny new thing, and individualizing equity. So as we think about the pacing for privilege detour, you can see the key phrases up on the screen that really capture what this detour looks like. It's prioritizing the comfort and interests of people with privilege over progress toward equity. So a common phrase around that is when people say, well, we're just not ready for that. It's, it's too soon for us to be looking at this work. I mean, there are a lot of other things that people say, but generally um, not being um, as quick as you could be around the work on equity is because you're spending time worrying about the comfort of the majority group or the people with privilege over the progress with that equity. So that's a detour that we see quite a bit. The second detour is, as you can see up on the screen, um, focusing really on adjusting the culture's mindsets, et cetera, of the people who are marginalized, rather than trying to adjust the conditions in our district that marginalize people. So an example would be um, thinking about addressing discipline disproportionality rather than digging into the actual causes of discipline. You know, like, and you hear things like, well, if that student could only learn how to behave um, versus how can I uh, look at my ability to be able to connect with students and understand what some of the causes of um, the discipline disproportionalities that we see in many of our districts are occurring. The third detour that we see a lot is um, mistaking celebrations of diversity for actual progress toward equity. So things like Diverse Friends Day, or we could all name something I'm sure from our own organizations or from other places where we've worked where um, people feel that celebrating a certain culture is a move toward equity. And it's not to be negative about that. We just know that there's a much broader um, way that we need to be thinking about equity and actually changing conditions for students and families that we can't get stuck on just thinking that doing something around a particular day is going to move us as far as we need to be moved in these conversations. And then one of our colleagues alluded to this a little bit around um, not seeing race, but the colorblind detour. So it's it's really trying to think about ra racism through pretending that race doesn't exist. And we, and we hear this a lot, right? Things like the phrases that you see up on the screen, we're all one race, um, or saying things like by focusing on race, we're making things more divisive, which actually isn't true. It's about having those deep conversations that help us understand and empathize with people who aren't like we are. Um, and then again, just using the, the phrase right out of the title, I hear many, many times in my travels, people saying, well, I don't see color. And that, first of all, is not true because we all generally see somebody when they walk in the room. And it's also um, a phrase that is insulting to our friends and colleagues of color, because if you don't see their color or their race, then you're actually not seeing them. So I think it's really critical that we um, dig deeply into that detour and understanding how to continue to move toward more equity in our settings. And then finally, uh, the shiny new thing as it's called detour. And this is uh, using examples of programs such as the ones you see listed on the bottom of the slide to speak about equity moves when those programs were never designed with equity in mind or to do that work for us. So the, the challenge with that is that what I like to say, and we talk about this a lot in our equity audits, is that we love, it's very important, obviously, for many reasons right now, for all of us to be digging into social emotional learning or SEL practices um, and, and PBIS and restorative practices. Those are all programs or practices that support equitable outcomes for students, but they're not in and of themselves equity solutions. So it's, it's an important nuance, um, but equity isn't a program. Equity is a mindset, equity is an understanding, and equity is a willingness to dig in and look at practices and structures and not a program can solve that. So we have one more to dig into and then you're going to get a chance to explore these on your own with a team and come back and, and help us understand your understanding of one of these detours. So the final one that we'll share this afternoon is the individualizing racism detour. And it's 
thinking about racism as interpersonal incidents, sort of as one-offs or attitudes or biases, while not looking closely at the larger structural racism and institu institutional inequities that exist in our policies, practices, and systems. So an example, as you see on the bottom of the screen, is you know, disciplining students for biased actions only, rather than understanding the underpinnings of, of why students may make racist comments or homophobic, homophobic comments that perpetuate those biases and really being um, willing to examine those structural um, underpinnings of the actions that we're seeing. So a lot of information, um, and this is not like a, a something you're going to like learn in an after afternoon entirely, but I think that the overview and the materials that you have in your participant guide should give you enough information to be able to have a good discussion with your colleagues in breakout rooms. So if you would get your participant guide back out, you'll see uh, a link to a note catcher. Or I'm just going to try to find the page for you all. It is on page five, I believe. It says link to equity detour note catcher. So if you can find that link and open it up, once again, you'll be asked to make a copy. You really only need one person in your group to have the link um, because we'll ask you to have one note taker. Um, but go ahead and open that up now. And we're going to give you. Let me check my clock. That's going to be perfect. We're going to give you 15 minutes in your team total to do this. So there will be six teams. And if you notice, um, there are six uh, equity detours. And what, how this is going to work is in a moment, Chelsea is going to send you into breakout rooms. And if you are asked to join breakout room one, you are going to be team one. So you'll work on the first equity detour and so on and so forth. So you have to pay attention to the team that you're assigned to. And that will be the equity detour that you study in your session. So the first thing and most importantly is to identify a timekeeper, a recorder and a spokesperson. So you can keep yourselves on track and really um, have a robust conversation but not run out of time. And then we're going to ask you to use one um, Google doc per team to guide the conversation. We'd like you to review the definition of your detour. And then be prepared to discuss your understanding of the detour with the group, depending how much time we have with our group. Um, and most importantly, we'd like you to identify and record some examples of where you think you've seen this detour in your setting. And then also how you might start to mitigate that detour in your setting. So pick one of those. I don't suspect you have time to dig into all the ones that you generate in 15 minutes. So understand, come to a common understanding of what the detour means figure out some examples from your settings, have a conversation about how you might be able to mitigate this detour in your setting, and then we'll come back together and have a quick report out on what you found. Any questions about what we're doing before Chelsea sends you into breakout rooms?